Reviving came out in 94. And just to refresh your memory and, and the, the listeners' memory, that was before school shootings, before 9-11, before c- personal computers, before cell phones. Um, so many things were different at that time. And uh, girls were very angry at their parents because the prevailing theory at that time was, if you have a teenager you're in trouble, it's because you're in a dysfunctional family. And girls believed it and their parents believed it. And meanwhile, the girls I was seeing in my office, uh, my daughter was in high school too, so I was seeing her friends. And most of them are coming from very good families, the kind of families that want to do everything they can to facilitate their daughter's growth and and, uh, overall mental health. And uh, what I realized was these girls were blaming their parents, but their misery wasn't coming from their parents. Their misery was coming from uh, school. My daughter, for example, would wake up pretty cheerful in the morning and just come home grumpy as hell. Uh, the other thing was they were, this was the era of MTV, and girls were starting to feel uh, extremely insecure about their bodies. Um, so I wanted to write about what I felt was a dysfunctional culture. And I was uniquely suited for that because my undergraduate degree was in uh, cultural anthropology. And I was very interested in how culture affects personality. And then in psychology, I was very interested in how personality is shaped by culture. So looking at teenage girls in therapy through the lens of culture just came very natural to me. And it actually, I I take a lot of pride in this. It, It changed the paradigm some for psychology and for the way everyone thought about teenage girls. Now, I wasn't the only one. Gilligan was out there. She did a beautiful job. There were some other people writing about girls. But my daughter and I updated and revised Reviving Ophelia. And one thing we did was um, we sent out copies of the old Reviving to girls all over the country and smart girls and readers who we knew would make a commitment and keep it. And we told them, go through this book, cross out everything that's boring, no longer relevant, that you don't want to read. And on the other hand, write in the margins all through the book what you want to know more about. So we got rid of a lot of material and we added a lot of material. The main thing girls wanted to hear about was social media, social media, social media. That's what they wanted to hear about. Also, in the original book, believe it or not, there was not a chapter on anxiety. But many of the girls uh, that we we corresponded with by uh, the time we published the 25th year edition were actually extremely anxious, uh, highly anxious, panic attacks, a uh, lot of anxiety around school shootings, a lot of anxiety around academics. Uh, in many cases, girls weren't leaving the house very much. A lot of social anxiety, like just simple things like Um, the idea of going out for a cup of tea with a friend made him too anxious. So one of the big differences 25 years later, uh, girls were primarily staying home in their bedrooms with their devices watching Netflix on a Saturday night. But here's a positive thing. The girls in, uh, in the more recent time loved their mothers. They often describe their mothers as their best friends. And the change in tone around family was so different. And I I hypothesize that the difference is the world has gotten much harder and meaner and that girls really trust and and need their families in their family. There's also a a cultural shift that's happened because of reviving Ophelia that um, the mothers of those adolescents were the adolescents who had mothers that read Reviving Ophelia. That's right. I'm one of them. You know, like right now at this point, you know, we have adolescent children. That's right. And when I was a sophomore in high school, your book came out. And I remember being in therapy and my mom just being so frustrated with feeling like, the, feeling blamed. I had anorexia. Yeah. Really feeling blamed for my anorexia. And, and she carried a tremendous amount of guilt about it. And she was also a middle school teacher and she went to a talk uh, by you 
Mm. And it, it changed the way that she saw herself as a parent and also saw these adolescent girls. So there's, there's a shift that happened as a result of reviving Ophelia that now we don't think about, we just don't think about uh, adolescent struggles in that way anymore, that it's the mother's fault or it's the family's fault or that, or that it's the adolescent's fault, that there's something wrong with them that they're right. struggling. Right. So a lot yeah. has changed, but, but there's also a through line that, that is this is very much the same of this. I mean, that um, your subtitles are always good, like so, say, saving the selves of adolescent girls, that there's a self that gets lost um, mm. during, during the, the vibrant girl that's out climbing trees and picking flowers and making up stories somehow changes during those adolescent years. And the, the lessons that you teach in Reviving Ophelia are, are um, timeless mm. in, in a lot of ways. So tell us a little bit about that. Hi, I'm Dr. Diana Hill. Thank you so much for joining me with Your Life in Process. And if you want more, if you're interested in applying these processes to your daily life, join me at my membership, More Life in Process. At More Life in Process, you will get meditations for you to practice at home. You'll get extra bits from the episode that maybe got recorded after the fact. You're going to get PDFs and handouts, things that you can use to apply your daily practice to your life. And and I can't wait to see you there. $5 a month, $50 for the year. You can go to yourlifeinprocess.com to sign up. Like the, if we think about the, um, the coping skills for resilience, uh, mm -hmm. what, what is necessary during that time of adolescence? Yeah, well, one thing that, that you're referring to is the, the book is really development psychology too, isn't it? Right. And it's, it's about the ways uh, people 13 and 14 years old think. And um, so one of the things I, I talked about in Reviving Ophelia is the necessary, uh, how necessary it is to have a North Star and some sense for uh, where you want to go, what kind of person are you, what are your values, um, what you find meaningful, what kind of people would you have your friends? So those are, those are all sort of under the category of knowing yourself and building a self. Building a self through one of the great things you can do in therapy, as you know as a therapist, is help people build a self. Help people um, tell positive stories about who they are. Help people uh, become richer and deeper in their sense of... of um, understanding of, of the world and, and moral imagination. Then another set of skills is really, we could call it um, emotion management. And that is everything from rating your stress to having reasonable expectations to self-calming skills, understanding how to calm down, uh, to perspective skills. I won't always feel this way tomorrow, I'll feel different. Or as I told one girl, you won't always be trapped in the halls of a junior high. Life is long and you'll be out of middle school Get before you know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are really important. Then a lot of stuff about social skills, you know, how to relate to people, how to be a good friend, um, how to listen, how to stand up for yourself, how to have boundaries, uh, the power of yes, the power of no, uh, how to make decisions about the kind of people you want to be with, how to make sexual decisions. I mean, I don't know a lot right now about what's happening with um, sexual decision-making in the schools. You would be much more of an expert in, in this age group than I am. But I do know that there's kind of two poles, and one is a, a sort of a sex is so weird and scary right now, I'm staying away from it. You know, and maybe when I'm in college or maybe I'll wait till I get married. I mean, it was very surprising to me how much more abstemious girls are now than they were in the mid 90s. Um, uh, I mean, I remember in the mid 90s, girls would say things like, well, I just want to do it and get over it. Yeah. I don't think girls are saying that so much now. And then on the other hand, there's a great deal of, oh uh, God. Uh, sex without relationship now. And, and that was a little bit unusual then too. 
I mean, most of the sex was in some kind of, of, even if it was temporary, there was a belief on both people's part. It was a relationship at the time they had a sexual experience together. So, yeah. So I did a lot of, of helping girls make decisions about when they would be ready uh, for a kiss. And then when they would, what kind of conversations they would need to have to, to want to do more than kiss. So, yeah, those are some of the, um, the sessions that a therapist can have with a client, an adolescent that sometimes they can't always have with, with their parent. Does this yeah. ring a bell with your work, Diana, with what yeah. you're doing now? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I work more with adults now. I'm not, I don't work with adolescents as much anymore. Um, I actually got pretty burned out in working mm. with uh, primarily eating disorders in adolescents. And now, now I work with their parents <laughs> and, um, and what I see in their parents and what I see in myself in in my forties is very much what you write about in seeking peace, mm. which is the, um, the meltdown mm. that people in their mid forties experience. And that you share about having experienced after you wrote reviving Ophelia of spending so much energy in, um, an output in mm -hmm. taking care of people or being the best, you know, parent, the most involved, informed, whatever parent, and, uh, and then just crashing. Mm -hmm. And, and it's another dichotomy, you know, it's sort of the, the, the sex, either, you know, sex with people that you don't know, or no sex with, um, I think with parents, it's either, you know, you're all in and you're over involved, and you're putting all this energy into uh, whatever career is it, big growth mm -hmm. time in terms of career and and also for times of change I mean, I think women had had careers um my mom had a career when I was an adolescent but it, it's different now where women have careers mm -hmm. you know like yeah, full absolutely. on they you know uh, women are, are running running stuff and um, and then also expected to be parenting at the same time so T tell us a little bit about the meltdown uh, in terms of your confession, your chronicles yeah. of the worst Buddhist in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, in Seeking Peace, I wrote about my life, but I wrote about it through the prism of becoming a, a very popular writer mm -hmm. and doing a lot of traveling and speaking. I had one year I spent more time in hotel room beds than in my own bed. And uh, that didn't work very well for me. I'm a homebody. I like my cat. I like my friends. I like my trees um, and my fireplace. And um, I, I really, as as I think, it's a common thing. If you're you're someone who a lot of people are aware of, but as your public self becomes bigger, your small your yourself, your real self that's inside, uh, sort of shrivels up from lack of attention because. Um, you're so busy responding to the the needs uh, that come before you as a public self. And uh, what actually happened with me was it was with the middle of everywhere, the book that came out uh, right after 9-11. Um, it wasn't doing well. I'd gotten a sizable advance. I felt a real obligation to help my publisher sell that book because I, I wanted them to not lose money. I've always felt that. I, I've always felt like, if somebody paid me, I was going to do the job I was paid for. So I was out on the road much more than I usually was. I agreed to more work and more scheduling and so on. And I was out on the road at a time when people didn't much like to be on flight, on airplanes. And um, I ended up in November with a bad cold, flying to speak at a little college in Ohio. And we had a three commuter little planes flying. We were in a snowstorm. We got off this plane. I'd been reading Fast Food Nation on the plane. Oh, yeah. And uh, we, we were driving toward uh, the, uh, the venue. We hadn't had any food all day. So we stopped at the only restaurant that's available. And it's, it's not good. It's got some dead flies in the window. But we go in. And uh, I told my husband, I need to go home. This is, I need to go home. I can't do this anymore. And we went through with the job. I, I spoke at this little college, and then we got back home. And fortunately, in the winter, I don't travel much. Uh, the roads are too bad. The planes are icy and so on. So I had two or three months when I didn't speak. 
And I didn't go to holiday parties that year. Didn't do much of anything. I lay in front of my fire and read history. History is a wonderful way to keep things in perspective. I um, drank a lot of tea. And I started reading a lot of Buddhism. When I read psychology, I, I read psychology at first, but it kept making me feel badly about myself. You know, it just kept making me think, oh, do I have an anxiety disorder? Uh, do I have post-traumatic stress reaction, et cetera, et cetera. But when I read Buddhism, I felt very differently. I felt like what I was hearing was, you're in a community of sufferers, like all people are. We all suffer. That's part of being human. And I felt, uh, I felt a connection to other people as opposed to the disconnection I was feeling. Um, so I started meditating, and that was very helpful. I went out on the road again, uh, but not so much. I, I set much stricter boundaries about the work I did and how much work I did. And I, I very much worked my way back to being normal. And, you know, I say it was a meltdown or a breakdown. It was a very polite meltdown. I don't think anybody knew about it but my husband, you know, because I just stayed home and was quiet for a while. But uh, it was a good thing to do. And I wish you, I wish anyone who gets in a position where they feel like I'm in a spot I just don't want to be in and I maybe can't handle it. It's, it's starting to affect my, my blood pressure in my case, my nerves. It's a great luxury to be able to just stop at that point and rest. And it's wonderful therapy. You know, a lot of the old ancient therapies really were just rest there. You send somebody to the magic mountain to sit around and look at the view with a cup of tea for a few months. And they, they got better. You know, it's a, it's a really good treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, there was something about also removing you from this external self, the, as you described, yeah. like as your external self got bigger, you were neglecting your inner self. And one of the challenges, I actually think a lot of people can, maybe a lot, maybe you're not famous, but a lot of people can relate to that experience now yeah. because of social media Absolutely. because the external self is something that people are spending a lot of time promoting and curating and uh, you know I have I have colleagues that have large followings on their social media and I can watch them posting certain things and then I'll call them up and, and it looks like they're having a beautiful time with their family or whatever and I'll call them up and I'm like how are you doing oh just terrible yeah, it's horrible. That funny. I'm I'm so you know stressed out. I'm like, whoa, wow. There's a mismatch here between what, <laughs> what I'm seeing and and a lot of these things are planned out like a week in advance. Like they're not real time. What what's yeah. popping up on your screen, and and that that removal that that break to find yourself again and take a rest, take a beat. Yeah, but, um, yeah. This is, I feel like that's, that's a, talking about developmental stages. That's a midlife. It, it's very much culturally influenced. If you think about, um, you know, it's not something wrong with you or that you can't handle it. There's cultural influences in terms of that, but also uh, a midlife um, necessity because you feel like in mid, I think in midlife, you just feel like you don't have enough time. There's a feeling of time poverty. Well, there's some really good, uh, research that looks at mental health across time and the age you are in the mid forties is actually the, the hardest time in a human lifespan. And I think that phenomenon that, that you may be experiencing, some of your listeners may be experiencing of just kind of hitting a wall and boy, I don't know if I can keep doing this is, is really common. The other common uh, experience is a kind of an existential crisis around is this the life I want it? You know, is, is this really what I had in mind for myself? And how many of my needs is it meeting? And so on. And, and those are big questions that hit about your age. Now, by my age, in contrast, uh, most of my life's over. I've got a very little future and a great big past. And I don't struggle with that ex existential question of, is this the life I want? It's the life I've had, you know, and it's the life I mostly will have until I'm gone. But you're right in the thick of it, Diane. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a feeling of responsibility at this age, of responsibility for your children to set them up well for a good life. 
and then responsibility to set up your future. Yes. You know, yes. Wow. Yes. Um, yes. You know, this is where the questions of purpose and meaning and, and all of that start to surface. And then things can feel meaningless when you're task mastering your, your day, you know, mm -hmm. you just kind of are going through the motions, whether, and also in your relationships, you know, as well. And so, yeah, I feel like the, the seeking peace book was probably most relatable to me, but the one that I, um, I guess gave me the most hope is the women rolling North book. Yeah. Because you yeah. Um, are writing about aging and women and aging in a really different way than uh, what we're taught as women about what to expect. I mean, that we're all kind of worried that we're going to go gray and our boobs are going to drop and <laughs> all the things. Oh man, the cultural messaging around older women is just terrible. Well, first of all, women my age are the happiest people in the entire human race. And I think it's because we figured out, we've kind of figured out the coping skills we need to be happy. Um, and of course, not all of us are, but at my age, one of the things that I said in Lemon Roy North, if you don't grow better, you grow bitter. And it's very catalytic age for growth because on one hand, uh, most women my age have more time uh, and they're having extraordinarily good experiences with women friends or travel or creative pursuits or just so many wonderful things happen when time opens up. Um, on the other hand, it's a time where uh, children and even grandchildren are growing up in a way uh, where uh, there starts to be a regular amount of loss in every year. And so it's a, it's a challenging time. And the sorrows of, of older women need to be balanced by joy. And most of us seem to figure out that um, algebra and be able to do it. Uh -huh. So one story I tell in, in uh, Women Growing North is I used to teach at the university and I'd swim down at the university pool. And I'd be in the locker room and all these young women would be changing clothes and they'd be so insecure about their bodies. They'd be all hunched over like this, trying to just not have anyone see any part of their body. And they'd also be making these negative comments about their bodies constantly. And then they'd be talking about, for the most part, stress, academic stress, stress with family, money stress, stress with female friends, stress with male friends. And a lot of times they'd be talking about uh, looking forward to getting loaded on the weekends. Or they would be actually bragging about how drunk they'd been the weekend before, which was kind of a shock to me because women went when I was in college, women drank, but they kept quiet about it. They did not ever brag about it because women drinking was such a negative picture. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when I switched to my gym for older women, it was totally different. The women are walking around in their old underpants and bras and joking around and laughing and totally relaxed about you never hear anybody say anything bad about their bodies they they don't think about their bodies in in that kind of evaluated way anymore and they tend to be very nurturing toward each other and often talk about for example how beautiful the morning is or how excited they are that they're going to see a grandchild but the tone was so strikingly different and so it actually I think if you ask a lot of people, would you like to go back and relive your life? They would go, no, you know, because they're in a spot now where they realize how happy it's possible to be. Yeah. I feel that way when I look at um, young moms with newborn babies, I appreciate them. I want to hold them for a few moments and just savor the little tiny hands and, but I don't want one. <laughs> That's right. It's like, well, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I remember how hard it was and how hard it was to enjoy it. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and I see that shift in uh, the older women that I work with, um, in terms of what, what they do worry about and what they don't worry about mm -hmm. any, anymore. And the freedom that comes from, in some ways, we're all afraid of becoming invisible, but there's a freedom in becoming invisible. invisible. In some ways. Yeah, there absolutely is. And also, um, the invisibility means that nobody's paying attention. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. So that's a pretty, pretty nice thing. You know? yeah. 
I was giving a um, workshop with two pretty prominent psychologists last week. It was a full day workshop. And I woke up an extra hour earlier to blow dry my hair. An hour. Because I have a lot of hair. <laughs> oh, <honey. laughs> and I And while I was blow drying my hair, I was like, I was thinking, I don't think that these men are spending an hour blow drying their hair before this workshop. Maybe they're spending that hour sleeping or, you know, enjoying a yes. cup of coffee yes. or, yes. and in all the extra stuff, all the extra stuff mm-hmm. that we do with the hunching over, putting our clothes on, the worrying, covering up our stomachs. I mean, how many women have sat on my couch with a pillow over their stomach? Oh. Um, you know, these, these things that are just these subtle uh, energy sucking behaviors that women engage in from adolescence through midlife. Um, but hopefully we get a little more free uh, in our 60s and beyond. So um, a life in light takes us into another realm. You know, we have women rowing north, which starts to give us hope for happiness as w- with aging. And then a life in light, I feel like it's it's sort of all of it put together. It's all of it put together. It starts, mm-hmm. I, you, you share these, as I was reading it, the way in which you write makes you think about, huh, what were my childhood pets? Or mm-hmm. huh, what are my memories of my grandmother? Or who were the people in my life that made me feel like I mattered? And those mm-hmm. are some of the stories that you mm-hmm. tell. And, and then also how we grapple with parents that are imperfect, but mm-hmm. also start to have compassion for them that they were doing the best they could in the mm-hmm. circumstances that they were in. Yeah, uh, I loved writing a Life in Light. And in a sense, I don't know if I'll write another book, Diane. It was kind of a, a benediction for me. It was kind of a way of saying to the reader, this is what I figured out about how to be happy. This is what I figured out. And you can figure it out too. You can have a life in light too. It, it's, it's a question of uh, intention or attitude and a set of skills. Happiness is, is an attitude and a set of skills. And I truly believe that if a person wants to be happy, they can learn the skills they need to be happy. And it just here's just one little example. Uh, I believe that generally we find what we look for. So if we look for money, we'll probably find it. There's ways to make money eventually in this culture. Uh, if, if we look for prestige, we can probably figure out a way to get some prestige. But when I wake up in the morning, I spend, I actually spend at least an hour just getting ready for the day. Not blowing and right setting, not and no, I never, I don't have to. My hair is just what it is. But uh, no, getting emotionally ready, journaling, um, meditating. But I set my intention for the day, and sometimes I'll say, "Today I'm going to look for uh, evidence of love in the universe," or "Today I'm going to look for beauty," or "Today I'm going to give myself plenty of moments." when I just stop and pay attention. And those little uh, setting of intention skills can make such a difference in a day. Like for example, with you, Diana, you're very busy. You're very harried, I can tell. But if you could set your intention, for example, to have every day, uh, could be a different intention, but to have something that gives you joy every day that you're on the lookout. It would, it would make a little difference in your day. And then, of course, the great survival skill at any age is gratitude. Just being able to be grateful for an interview with a, a person like you or a sunny day, which is what we have today, or a good bowl of vegetarian chili, which is what I'm going to have for lunch at noon. All of them, you know. So setting your intention and going with gratitude. And those are um, those are Buddhist principles too. Yeah. You can see that coming through in you. And then I also I also wonder about how do we get to be 75 and have the health and the connections to be able to to enjoy the time. Yeah. Well, I'm not an expert on health. Um yeah. but um I am an expert on friends. And especially women friends. And I I see women friends as my mental health insurance policy. I've lived in the same town 50 years. 
And my husband's, we're both psychologists, so we know psychologists, but he's also been a musician since before I met him. So we have a musical community and we have a writing community. And I'm in a Sangha, so I have a Buddhist community. And then um, I'm an environmentalist. I have an environmental community and I work with refugees. And I think a lot of my my happiness is I have these, these beautiful activities that I can be engaged in um, at any level I want. Um, I, I don't ever, I try not to ever get to the point I wake up and look forward to a day with dread. To me, one of the real centering acts in the morning is, is to have my mind right so that I'm looking forward to the entire day with pleasure. Even the things that are difficult, like, for example, who likes a dentist appointment? But I'll, I'll tell myself, be so grateful you have a dentist. Be so grateful you live in a time when your teeth aren't falling out or in pain. And that'll, that'll move me into a little bit different spirit about that. So, For people that struggle with that, I mean, you've, you've practiced this over a lifetime, but maybe for folks that are feeling depressed or they do feel that, wake up with dread. Yeah. And it feels false in some way. Sometimes gratitude can feel forced or false. Mm -hmm. Do you have suggestions mm -hmm. around that? Like on, on your worst, on the, on the worst days, on the worst days. What well, of course, think? everybody has worst days and, and I wouldn't claim to be a, a pinnacle of mental health myself. I hope I, I don't sound that way when I talk to you. I have days that are very hard to pull things together. I mean, one of the gifts of my, my uh, age is I'm not in a hurry. I don't have to pull things together quickly. If it takes me longer to sit and, and think and, and put myself together emotionally, I have the time to do it. I also, because I'm not working full time, have a lot more activities that are easy to enjoy, like walks with friends or, or tea with a friend or whatever. But generally, everyone can feel grateful for the gift of life. I mean, every morning when you wake up, you're breathing, you're alive, your eyes are working, your ears are working, you can taste, you can touch, you can smell, you can see, um, you can walk in most cases. All of these things are things to be grateful for. Um, the sun's coming, that's something to be grateful for. Uh, all of it. And so even in the, it's, it's not like, Privileged people are the ones who are the most grateful. It's actually people who are having the roughest times that are the skilled people with gratitude because it's, they need it. They need it to be able to go out and face life. And so in um, Women Roy North, I interviewed a woman who had a great many disabilities, very poor, worked at a difficult job as a, a telemarketer. Uh, had had a very rough life all of her life, including she had just recently lost her boyfriend, who she was just crazy about. And she was the biggest laugher, the most grateful of anyone I interviewed. And just she had the knack of knowing how to enjoy life. Now, these are things nobody picks up in one night. You build these skills over a lifetime. But what I argue in every book is it's not too late ever to build these skills. And I try to show people through my writing, I try to be a cultural therapist. I try to show people, here is what I know about building these skills. And some of them, some of what I write will be helpful to one person, some will be to another, I hope. Mm -hmm. I remember being an adolescent and looking up at my mom when she'd come into bed and I'd, I'd be worried about something. and. Um, thinking, I can't wait until I'm 40 with my mom mm. and I'm through all this you know, so it's <laughs> over, and I can be like my mom and like, where would I want to wear and <laughs> do what I want to do. And then now that I'm in my forties, I look at 70 year olds and 70 year olds like my mom doing it. She yeah. has art and art gallery. She leads people on painting trips around the world. She has writing groups. She's involved in um, environmental stuff. And I look at her and I'm like, I can't wait 
<laughs> we're the luckiest ones. Yeah. 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 You are the luckiest ones. And there's, and, and then you also sit in a lot of wisdom. So you're, you're at the end, like you've lived, you've lived a long life, but you've, all of that has built it, has like seasoned you, you know? And, yeah. to, and so you're just like a good cast iron skillet. Cook a lot, cook a lot well, that's a very nice description yeah. of me. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Thank you for your life's work. And, uh, and it was really impactful for me as an adolescent to read Reviving Ophelia, but it's only just in this last little bit that I've started to open up all these other books and I have a lot to learn from you. So thank you for sharing this. And uh, well, thank you. It's been a beautiful interview. I'm so happy to have met you, Diane. Take care with the light coming in on both of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs>